We do have creative license, but always where the lore permits. We would never go with an idea that would go against the core elements of Assassin's Creed. Like, if we want to create a new character, we will make sure that it stays true to the universe. Fabrice Latame, story designer, Assassin's Creed, Brotherhood of Venice. Hello, and welcome to Visions of the Past. My name is Andrew, and I'm the host of this Assassin's Creed lore podcast. This is episode 43, and today we're not alone. Today, we have a special guest, the nerdy archer herself, the host of Rookery's Archives, Louise Chase. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. Once I found out that you enjoy this kind of board game, I couldn't not do this. So today... We're going to talk about the upcoming board game, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood of Venice, from Triton Noir. But what is Brotherhood of Venice? Can you uh, inform us a little bit more on what Brotherhood of Venice is, Luis? Yes. So, funny enough, it's a board game. It's got miniatures in it. So if anyone's ever played like Warhammer or Dungeons and Dragons, there's sort of the idea that you will control characters and stuff and going through like little mission packs. But there's also dice. There are synchronization towers. There are minifigs for main characters from the games, as well as like new characters and stuff. I remember seeing the artwork for Alessandro, and I fell in absolute love with her from first sight. And there's like loads of different missions. There's enemies from horsemen to brutes. There are DLC packs coming out, and it's all set in 1509. A small cooperative game but i believe there's some way you can play it on your own um i remember seeing two to four for the base game and then possibly more if you buy the expansions yeah because each expansion has two or three main characters i think one of them i think it's the tokyo expansion has layla yeah that tokyo expansion is going to be weird it's absolutely something i want to mention i do also feel that it's important to mention that this episode is not sponsored by brotherhood of venice but we just really like this game <laughs> but if triton to send a copy of the game i'll gladly accept it and i'll gladly play it the game according to the kickstarter does start in 1509 we are a small team of assassins whose names i didn't write down because they're brand new characters it starts after Ezio's defeat of cesare in brotherhood they have three expansions there is roma which introduces four assassins with their own backstories new minifigs, and they run the same abilities. These players can be used in the same campaign. It's not until we get to the second expansion known as Creed versus Crows. The idea here is that two teams are to compete objectives before the other teams in eight memories. Now the third one, the one you've mentioned already, is called Tokyo 21 XXI. Now this expansion is a modern day story set in Tokyo that features uh, Leila Hassan, Rebecca Crane, and Kayoshi Takakura. And they must infiltrate a research lab because they managed to create new optical camouflage and must find out how big of an advantage it would give the Templars. I believe that also stated there was a hidden fourth player in that expansion. They just didn't tell it, say who it was. Yeah, I just got the Kickstarter. One secret modern day assassin, but it's literally just a box with a question mark. I have no idea who that is. <laughs> I'm quite excited. But my guess is that's going to be someone from Valhalla. Oh, that's interesting. Because my first thought was Sean, but we already have Rebecca. If, if they were going to put Sean in this, they would uh, put him in the marketing. They put him in the marketing for Assassin's Creed Gold, the audiobook. Yeah, that's a good point. There is one thing I also want to point out to anyone who thinks about wanting to get this game. Right now, the pre-orders on Kickstarter is closed. They're not taking orders for standard shipment. We do not have an exact release date because COVID pushed back their production schedule. But according to the Kickstarter, if you dig a little bit, you get a kind of an idea on what the prices very well might be when it releases. The main game looks to be around 120 uh, US dollars, Roma 49, the Creed versus Crows at 43, Tokyo 21 at 49, but you could bundle all the expansions together for 119, 
or you could just buy everything together for two eighty five. They released the rule book uh, back in. Oh, it's been a couple of months. Yeah, March? early twenty twenty at least. So when you go through to those rule books, you ha- you ask yourself, how does a board game fit? into Assassin's Creed lore. After looking through everything, and I've come to one way that this thing can can fit. It's the same way Assassin's Creed Odyssey and Valhalla fit within Assassin's Creed lore, with the choices that you get. It's the Animus. Ah, uh, okay. The game features characters and locations that we've seen within Ezio's trilogy, but it also features the crows which was first shown in assassin's creed identity that was a ios game i think yeah mobile the one thing to me in my mind at least that confirms that this is animus tech is there's one figurine called the lion of venice and that figurine is meant to be battled i've never been to venice but there's my understanding that outside of um Oh, goodness. What is the Doge's Palace, I think it is, that there's this big statue of a lion. Well, the only way a statue is going to come alive and battle you is through the Animus. Oh. Unless it's some cor- sort of piece of Eden. This is the lion with the wings, isn't it? Yes, it is. The Piazza San Marco. San Marco. Okay. So when you go through and you see that this statue comes alive, there's one of two options. It's an Animus trickery or it's a piece of eden oh like with the olympus effect sort of yep and we don't have the story manuals yet because this comes out with a set of rule books and then the stories we haven't seen the stories yet yeah we have a few background pieces for the characters like alessandra but none of it's honed in yet and we don't know basically the background beyond it's 1509 and set in venice yeah pretty much except for the roma expansion and the funny thing about the crows and the creed expansion that's got a cesare figure in it it does and i am not sure what the time period that's set at because cesare fell in 1508 right in spain yeah so how is he back in roma if this takes place after the main game unless it's like unless they kind of take place concurrent with the story of Assassin's Creed Brotherhood. And it's sort of like, kind of again, an animus memory of possibly Cesare. But what, while not involving Ezio, so it's something else happening in the city at the same time. So it's before Cesare's death. I have a feeling it's going to be set kind of concurrent with Brotherhood because there's a mention in that expansion that Ezio's leading the Brotherhood and Cesare is leading the crows, and that something happens, there's a way to bring each of them into the battlefield. The war automator. Yep. Oh yeah, Ezio's one of the hero cards. I'm glad that you brought up Ezio. Yeah. Because I was scrolling through the manual, you get two ways to finish a memory. You, If you fail it, you go back to your apprentices, and then you play again. If you fail as the apprentice, Ezio shows up, finishes the memory for you, and you get to read forward in the story. It's very Deus Ex Machina, isn't it? Yeah. And when I first read that, I kind of went, then what's the point in playing? Why don't we just read the manual and be done with it? That's a very good point. Because the whole point of board games and stuff like this is to have a little bit of replayability. So sort of you would have something in case you fail the mission. Because the dice aren't always kind to you. We play D&D. We know this. No. No, they're not. There's four unnamed assassins. So the big price for the first one, for the the main game, is because there's so many figures. Yeah, I'm just going through it and, oh my god, just looking at like 18 plus memory envelopes, 18 color bases, 50 plus tiles, 26 dice, four apprentice boards, 70 plus secret cards, 30 reward cards, reinforcements, equipment. Yeah. That's not even including, like, the tanks, the rooftops, the synchronizations, the characters, the enemies, things like the lion. Oh, God. Somehow or another, Leonardo's tanks show up. And there's also stuff that we don't know because it says 10 plus secret enemies. Yeah. Fast travel locations. Oh, God. Yeah. So this game is huge. So I do wonder how big these memories are. 
And sure, there's replayability because I saw that they have memory constraints, like started in Brotherhood. Oh, yeah. They have those optional things for like, oh, not so many guards with your hidden blades not being detected. And there's one thing I want to mention there. We talked about fail and then Ezio showing up. One of the ways you can fail is if there are so many guards on the map that the next turn comes by with reinforcements and you don't have enough pieces to put all the guards out. You automatically fail. <laughs> when you fail, you fail spectacularly. Yeah, absolutely. I know that's kind of a fail, but I kind of want to aim for that. Just how badly do you have to screw up to get all the pieces possible on the board when it's like 60 and not die? <laughs> yeah. And then they had a large tower that was an extra minifig that you could purchase. And I'm not sure why you need an extra tower when they come with towers for because you have to start the missions by sinking a viewpoint. Yeah, because it's not listed as a viewpoint. It's something completely different. Unless it's just a bonus location for different layouts and levels of the map. Maybe even, I don't know, more secret chests or something in there? Lore information? Maybe it gives you a secret card in the box. Yeah, I mean, there's so much in this game that we don't know, but we have have a good idea on how it ties into the lore though we just don't know like the intricacies of the story and how it fits yeah. into 1509 this is two years before Ezio goes to Constantinople and goes to Masayev mm -hmm. in your opinion how are they going to tie in the modern day expansion how does that going to work oh that's a very good question <laughs> one that I actually didn't consider think of this for a second Layla's in this if this comes out after Valhalla, Layla's not gonna die. Oh yeah, she has the star still, right? So far, but we don't know the story in Valhalla. But mm. I'm assuming that since it's Tokyo 21, it takes place in 2021 in Tokyo. And since, I think, AC3, every game modern story bit has taken place in the year the game was released. So like Syndicate's opening has the date of the game came out, which was October 23rd, 2015. The Ezio trilogy and everything to do with Desmond was basically from, I think from September to the 12th of December, 2012. When we bring up Layla, we see her in Origins in 2017 and Odyssey, they're dated 2018. So I'm expecting to see emails from Layla in- 2020. Not just 2020, 2019. 2019. I kind of expect backup. Like, we got a little bit of the modern day story with gold. So we get an idea of Gavin and Aaliyah and Michelle going after. The um, Altair 2 crew and stuff, yeah. Yep. And Gavin makes a comment that the only animus they have left is in Tokyo. Oh, that's intriguing. So I won't be surprised if the modern day of Valhalla starts or ends in Japan. Yeah, because we don't know what's going on with the modern day story yet. We only know that it's Layla again. It's Layla and there's something to do with bringing her into uh, ninth century England to do animus glyph puzzle climbing things. Yeah, because that could basically start anywhere as like Odyssey set in Greece, Peloponnesian Greece. But one of the first modern day segments we get is her on the banks of the Thames in London. And they moved around a lot. Yeah, if we if we have a modern day story with Layla, Kyoshi, Rebecca, and Layla, those three are most likely going to make it through Valhalla. Because we know Rebecca Crane's alive. Because at the end of Syndicate, nobody knew she was alive. But I think later glyphs you could pick up, little helix bits, confirms that she's stable. Yep, that story is, for most casual players, a dangling thread. A five-year dangling thread. Kyoshi was in Odyssey. He's one of your lookouts. Yeah. There's precedents and easy storylines that you can connect the dots here. But I'm going to be honest. I wish we had Claudia in it. Yes. Because she's essentially the leader when Ezio goes to... Constantinople. She essentially takes over de facto. And takes over after he leaves the order for a couple months until they find a permanent mentor. Yeah, and we don't know what Claudia does pretty much the entire time. You know she gets married and that's it. Yeah, it's a very ham-fisted way of tying off an end. Like, oh yeah, she gets married, but, but what, what, what? What does she do? So here's my thinking. You said if they 
really wanted to expand the universe and not just go, oh, Ezio is very popular. He's in this game. They could set it while Ezio's in Constantinople because you're only two years before that. Mm. And say, this is something that Claudia is doing as she's the leader because she's got to lead the whole Italian state, not just the city of Rome. They could do it as a way of introducing more lore surrounding characters in periods that we don't know. Oh yeah, absolutely. So like with Claudia, but also we have, if it's in Spain, arguably. There's no telling what they could do with going to Spain and seeing Aguilar because he's in this time too, 1492. Yeah, that's my point, 1492. What happens after Maria dies? What happens when he sets Christopher Columbus off with the Apple of Eden? Why didn't Ezio meet him when they were both active at the same time? They could easily make another Spanish expansion. You're jumping to the modern day, so you can jump to any location through the, the story. You can do anything you can give us as much as it would make people mad just like ending juno's life in a comic made people mad you could make roman republic with aya the roman expansion into Brit uh, britannia yeah claudius and the julius caesar campaigns caesar came twice and failed and you can recanonize the the roman brotherhood the circus liberus from the first series of french comics Oh yeah, that's a very good point. Because there's so much in the comics that is wonderful information and world builds, but it's not canon. All you need are a few lines of text or one nod in there to bridge that gap and make it canonical and well round out the series a little bit more. Absolutely. There's so many different things that they could do. And they went back to Ezio. From a marketing standpoint, I do get it. It was like, he is seen as many as the figurehead, which I don't completely agree with because, yeah, okay, he's had the most screen time. Yep. And he has the most information. We were there from his actual birth to his death in, the, in that square. But what about everyone else? You know, what if I want to know what Lydia's life was like post-World War One? What if I want to know, was Arno happy? That's what happened with Napoleon. Like, Jen Jennifer, Jennifer Scott. Yep. There are storylines that you could make out of it, and you could add it into Brotherhood of Venice, but we're also looking at the main game and the three expansions shelling out about 300 US bucks just to get everything. Which not everyone has. Right. I'm rounding up because... If you're not into a minifig game, you got to buy paint, you got to buy brushes. Sure, you could leave them as gray, but why? It's not always as appealing. I know some people like that, but no, I would want them colorful. Me too. And when you look at the assassins, they need that red, they need that white. There's so much that they can do with Brotherhood of Venice, though. I just don't see wanting to drop another $50 for an expansion pack when a comic or a novel will do just as fine bring this back to the rules pdf that you sent me and like it's so detailed there's little pieces of information about alert states and stuff but also kind of pieces of law in it as well like you could arguably just have this as like a small short story to add in or just have this as the events of a short story saves people probably 90 percent of the price of buying this $30 as opposed to 300 Like, I get you're making a minifig game, and those games are not cheap because of all the plastic that goes into it. You got this one in particular with Kickstarter, you have to create the molds. Everything is brand new, but I get that's why they went with the most popular time period the most marketable essentially because he's the one everybody's going to notice. Mm. That's why you go with Ezio. I, I get that, but from a narrative standpoint we know so much of Ezio's life that it's it's been done there's so much more you could explore yep like I would have been okay with here's a little Ezio figure he's gonna be at the beginning of the story oh he's disappeared because he's gone away because he found a letter now you deal with his sister yeah that would have been so much because there's so much we don't know about Claudia it would have been like how does she deal does she go traveling probably not because she is ill mentori and through her life, she spent most of her time behind a desk. I'm quite interested with the assassin in the apprentice cards. Because you've got the four apprentices. I think it's Alessandra, Claudio, Daria, and Bastiano. They're all sort of different. My understanding of the reading is that the four assassin novices are no-name novice guys. And then you get those four masters. Because each one has a bit of a backstory that we know. Like, I think from... The version of Alessandra's that I read, because she's the one that I've read the most often because I'm seriously considering making her coat. I love that outfit. I would wear that. Um, 
there's one version of it where she's Christina's daughter, Christina Vespucci. And when she's in her four, when she's about 14 years old, I think after her father's died or something's happened to her parents. Oh. She is taken or kidnapped by Templars or Templar affiliated enemies and they burn out her tongue. So see, she is mute and her sort of kind of combat style is like a battle language from what I read. Now, this is one of the assassins in the main story or Roma? Main story. It's one of the four main ones you get. Okay. She's supposed to be a daughter of Ezio's ex-love interest? Yes. Or at least in that version. I don't know if they'll change it in the final thing. Those two died during the bonfire of the vanities. Mm. Or at least the mother did. Because that's one of the repressed missions in Brotherhood. But what I'm thinking is obviously each figure is individual. They're all unique, but they're all assassins. But And do they have different techniques? Is there something special about them that... That's what I'm thinking. I wonder if like each person would have bonuses to, like, say, Bastiano has... Because he looks more like a typical rogue figure from D&D. Does he have bonuses to doing assassinations? Is one of them better at using firearms in an instant? Is one better at parkour and free running? Like, is there a benefit? Yeah, because we really don't have any of that information. Yeah. Is there a benefit of using different characters to replay a memory? Or are we... Or do we have to use two, three, four to complete it? And if that's in the main rule, I didn't see it. Because there's character cards that come with it. So what if that information is sort of like a biography or they have these little pieces on the back as little play finesse, not finesse, what's the word? Like a little bit of flavor to change how you play the game. So yeah, you have a favorite character and you played it this way, but if you and your friend want to replay it, maybe use a different character, change your play style a bit. How would this work with X person instead of Y? That would make replaying it worth it because right now with just looking at the price, you kind of go, but am I going to do it more than once? Yeah. I get the idea of wanting to make the players play more often, but there is one thing, speaking of the rules, was what they call their golden rule, the rule number zero. Situation in the game is not explicit. The players decide what to do. So even if the cards say move one guard to a close square, you can move that guard to any square that is close. So it's like it doesn't specifically tell you what to do, but it gives you that leeway to want to play again based on how you choose to play. But the big thing that brings me into games like Brotherhood of Venice and Dungeons and Dragons is the role playing aspect. You have to know your character. And while we get these new characters, and that's great from a lore perspective, as a playable character, that's kind of boring because you don't get to put any of yourself into it. Yeah, I'm interested in the lore behind the characters, but like, right. what's key for me, like, enamored to want to keep playing? What point do I have to kind of create this character if you tell me this is what they're like? Because I could have just easily said, that it's sort of like Dungeons and Dragons where you initially start and create a character. You roll or pick up certain things and make, say, how stealthy are they? Do they prefer firearms or knives or swords or something like that? How you would in a game. Like, you change your loadout of weapons depending on how you want to play. Like, I get the idea of everything now on is in lore, it's canonicized, it's it's there. It's always going to be there. But sometimes games like this kind of need that leeway. And you can create novices that don't jump through time for any way you want. Look at Brotherhood. We get how many unnamed assassins that we can recruit off the street? You don't need to have everything in lore. Because like history, not everything will be written down. Not everything will be recorded. Sometimes that ambiguity is nice for a role-playing element. It lets people have their own ideas. And when you have the idea of an animus, like with Valhalla and Odyssey, that gives you that choice, you get the idea of saying, sure, it's canon to us because we made it in our animus, but it's not historically canon because that person didn't say that. Or that person didn't kill that person. Yeah, it's canon for me, but it might not be canon for the next person or history. And I think that's one of the biggest issues that Odyssey has. 
but that's probably going to transfer over to Valhalla as well. And that's a whole nother hour and a half that we could probably sit and talk about. Yeah, I'm still quite interested in seeing how this is going to look as a final piece. Because it's still obviously not complete yet. It's not out. Yeah, I don't know what their manufacturing percentage is right now. Things might change. I mean, the rules probably did change at least a little bit. And we've not seen any of the memory pamphlets to see what we got. And there's nothing that's saying that with future expansions that they're going to make us buy more minifigs. You can easily make more stories with these characters moving forward. Yeah. You just have to be careful when everything is lore. When is Ezio not in Venice? When is he back to Rome? When is he in Constantinople? Do we have a local bureau leader? Who is that? Buy this one minifig for a couple pounds and be done with it. Yeah. There's ways that you can do it without making it $50 an expansion. But if you're a big publisher, then your story's 50 bucks anyway. So you could probably, thinking about it, because a lot of people play homebrew D&D. They make up their own worlds. And you could probably take these characters wherever you want and have fun with it because you're not creating stories for someone else to, to view within your own Assassin's Creed. Yeah, there's this opportunity for you to make and develop part of it. You can name these novice characters. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure there's some blank cards in the boxes. So you could, theoretically, if you wanted to keep using them or do like a celebration or kind of want to play, say, in-game missions from Two Brotherhood Revelations in Brotherhood of Venice... You could adapt them to however you wanted with the game set and the minifigs. There's room for replayability if you're creative enough to take action into doing it. You can make stories in Brotherhood of Venice that don't necessarily have to be canon. We've talked throughout about Layla and the expansion for Tokyo and what Valhalla could look like, what Odyssey has looked like, bringing this all together. The one thing that we did not mention, at least so far, is that... This story for the Tokyo expansion was co-created with the writing team at Ubisoft. So we're looking at official Ubisoft tie-in to maybe not official how they want to say it, but it fits directly into the lore. They're going to know before it releases what has happened in Odyssey, what's canonical within Valhalla, and it's going to move forward. It this gives tight cohesion with established lore and allows for them to know things that we don't know yet, like an unnamed boxed assassin from the modern day. It's either going to be a new character they introduce in Valhalla or it's going to end up being Berg. I'd quite like it to be Otso Berg, now that you've kind of convinced me of the idea. I want to thank you for joining us today. You can, of course, find new visions of the past episodes every Tuesday. Where can they find you, Luis? You can find me on Twitter at forward slash the nerdy archer. The podcast is on YouTube. It will be linked on the Twitter. New episodes every Sunday, hopefully with a couple of esteemed guests, but mainly just me rambling. Um, the most recent one I recorded was Lydia Fry. I'm also on Discord. I'm probably hanging around loads of the major Assassin's Creed servers. I'm a moderator on the official one. If you have enjoyed this episode and love Visions of the Past, I'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give a review on Apple Podcasts. If you have any questions about Assassin's Creed or topics that you'd like me to cover, please feel free to hit me up on Twitter and Instagram at visions underscore AC. And you can find those links in this episode's show notes. Until next time, my Assassin friends, make sure to follow the Creed. And to those Templars listening, may the Father of Understanding guide you. <laughs>